Cool. We need to talk about money, and we need a lot of it. We are talking post-World War scale here for the green transformation. According to EU estimates, we need an additional investments of 520 billion to deliver the Green Deal, okay, yearly, additional, on top of what we're already doing. According to others, McKinsey, for instance, they say we need 930 billion of additional yearly investments on top of what we're already doing. And the thing is, 60% of that, 60% of those investments that we need, they don't have a business case right now. So they won't generate profits, so the markets won't deliver that. But we need them, otherwise we won't get the transformation done. It's pretty simple. So, dear politicians and policymakers, here's what you can do to mobilize the finance that we need for that transformation. You need to create more 20, 21st century business models to mobilize investments, and for that, active industrial policy is key. And the EU is doing that a bit now with the Green Deal Industrial Plan, which is a good step in the right direction. And you already said it, Esther, we're going to need conditionalities here because it's essential that any government support to green industries, whether it comes from additional EU funds, through subsidies, or in any other way, it's essential that all of that is not just free hands out to any companies. You need to make sure that companies receiving that support, that they are fully on board with that transformation. Only the businesses really, really well suited to the job should get state support. And the easiest way to control that is to tie any government support to the achievement of social and ecological performance goals. And if the goals are not met, you just take the support away again. It's a very simple general rule. Businesses that aren't all in for the transformation, get out the way. Okay, even if we do all that really well, the second thing is, you know, like if we drive in all those investments that work really well, that still leaves us with roughly 25% of those 500 to 900 billion yearly. That's going to be financed by the governments. It has to be. It's like schools and infrastructure and all these things. And the discussion at this conference, I think, showed us very clearly that member states, many member states, they just don't have sufficient room for those investments at the moment. So right now, we risk leaving them behind. And you made a good point about the fiscal rules, so I'm not going to say anything more about the fiscal rules. That's the one thing that we can do. The second thing that we can do, and I think that's essential as well, is we're also going to need EU-level support for this, to have enough investments. And one thing that we believe is quite, you know, maybe the most feasible thing to do at the moment is to have an EU-level sustainable prosperity fund that borrows additional money from financial markets and, you know, invests that directly into green transformation projects. And then, last thing on money, I promise it. Sorry, I'm an economist, last point. I think the money is already there. It is, it's really there. It's just sitting on the Cayman Islands and not doing its job. <laughs> it's... <laughs> you know, like, the money is extremely and increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few between, and I'm gonna add some numbers to yours, between 2020 and 2022, in two years, roughly 26 trillion euro went to the richest 1% on top of what they already have. 26 trillion. We need, in the EU overall, around exactly that amount to finance the full green transformation, okay? So, let's not make it, as Kate said, finance versus life, but, you know, let's use that money instead to create sustainable prosperity for all. And then finally, and I will make that short because you have many concrete points on that. Pass rate number three, none of this stuff is going to work if we don't bring people with us on this transition. And right now, we see governments trying to make up for the lost time and the slow progress on the green transformation of the past with measures that are essentially imposed on people without implementing them. And hey, surprise, surprise, you know, they face backlash. You see that in France with the yellow vest. You see it with the farmers. In the Netherlands, there are many examples. And there will be trade-offs. That's inevitable. But let's not make it, you know, livelihoods of the people versus environmental protection. And I think one interesting thing that we can learn from those situations is after Macron failed to implement the petrol tax because of the yellow vests, he created a citizens' council. And he asked the people in the citizens' council to come up with, you know, green transformative proposals. 
And what's interesting about it is the stuff they came up with was actually much more transformative than the original petrol tax. And it went, like they had social measures to go along with it. Of course, you still have to implement it. My court didn't do that, which is a big problem because then you really lose trust of the people. So you should do it like that. It's not what I'm saying. But I think it was really interesting. So if you would implement that, you know, you would have a really interesting set of proposals by the people. So by involving the people, you actually don't slow down the transition, but you make it possible. And with those three points, by having a new North Star, mobilizing enough finance, and taking the people along, I think we can already take a huge step forward towards creating sustainable prosperity for all in the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you.